Good morning. You'll notice right away that Pastor Laura is not here this morning, and I need to share with you that um, earlier this week, uh, she was in a meeting with someone who has later tested positive for COVID. Um, according to CDC uh, protocols, she uh, was masked and distanced, so she probably is very safe, but um, she and the reentry team agreed that out of an abundance of caution, uh, she is staying home this morning until she receives results from her test. So I, uh, I invite you to pray with me, both for the person who did test positive for COVID for, for their uh, complete and quick recovery, and also uh, for Pastor Laura as she waits for that news. I want to welcome you if you are, uh, especially if you're joining us online this morning, I want to welcome you, and I want to let you know that there's a place for you here if this is the first time that you've visited with us. Uh, we are a community that celebrates the worth, dignity, and gifts of every person as a child of God. And we know that we are called to love God and all others unconditionally, to seek answers to our questions, and to serve God by serving others. And we invite you to be part of that, uh, that mission as well. A couple of announcements as we begin. First of all, there is a QR code that you can use this morning. You can use your phone and just point it up there and capture that QR code. It'll take you right to the sign-in uh, platform so that you can let us know that you were here because you might also notice that Pam Draper, our uh, connections coordinator, is not here this morning. She is on a well-deserved vacation getting a little bit of rest and so anything you can do to help us know that you were here this morning will be helpful. I also want you to know that there are ways that you can love, seek, and serve all week uh, on September 17th, which is a little bit more than a week from now. September 17th, we are going to participate in Lenexa Night at the Movies. You can find out more about that on our website and in our newsletter. The movie that they're showing is Soul, and so if you've seen it, you know it's a good film. If you haven't seen it, if you want to come out and join us, we're going to try to gather as a community and be present in Lenexa and appreciate the things that our neighbors are doing right in our midst. Also, Bible 101, a small group is beginning a week from tomorrow, led by Reverend Marilyn Gregory, who is a retired United Methodist clergy uh, woman and an extraordinary teacher. So if, there, if you just want to be in the presence of someone who is wonderful at sharing the good news of what our scripture is all about, please think about signing up for that small group. There's still room. If you're interested, you can email me, Sandra at stpaulslenexa.org. You can talk to me later this morning. And it's also First Sunday Food Drive Day, so if you have some uh, sta some pantry uh, staples that you could bring, you can bring and drop off in our lobby anytime today or during the week, and they will go to our partners. With all that being said, I invite you to take a deep breath and know that you are in the presence of God and stand as you're comfortable, and let's share in our call to worship. Out of the fullness of the lives God has given us, we have come to worship and to praise. With thanks, we offer to God the creativity of our minds, the warmth of our hearts, and the joy of our spirit. We love because God has first loved us freeing us from the power of sin and death. With glad hearts, let us join together in singing praise to God, Creator, Word, and Holy Spirit. In standing and sing our opening hymn, Help Us Accept Each Other. Accept each other as Christ accepted us. Teach us as sister, brother, each person to embrace. Be present, Lord, among us, and bring us to believe. We are ourselves. 
ourselves accepted and meant to love and live. Teach us, O oh Lord, your lessons as in our daily life we struggle to be human and search for hope and faith. Teach us to care for people, for all, not just for some, to love them as we find them, or as they make we are. Let your acceptance change us so that we may be moved in living situations to do the truth in love, to practice your acceptance until we know by heart the table of forgiveness and laughter's feeling on. Lord, for today's encounters with all who are in need, who hunger for acceptance, for righteousness and bread. We need new eyes for seeing, new hands for holding on. Renew us with your spirit, Lord. As you remain standing, let's affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. something to tell you. It won't make things perfect, and it may not make sense. But someday you'll see him as clear as my smile. Do you know the word temporary? It means only Toy breaks the detours a life makes temporary. Everything is temporary. A 
storm clears, a tear dries, a wing heals, a bird flies, the trust lighting your eyes. to stay the same. I know it's hard to watch a childhood going up in smoke. It's hard for me to watch a child who's growing up and choke back all the warnings I could scream to protect you from the things that aren't as solid as they seem. But then Everything is temporary. A child believes, a heart breaks, a love dies, a world shakes, the difference one life makes. Temporary. The trick is, hold it now as tightly as you can. Whether it's your favorite toy or a sad little boy who's trying hard to be a brave little man. Hold it tighter, cause you know you'll have to let it go. If you learn this though, you won't feel so sad. A playmate, a tear stain, a Christmas, a dad, the past times, the worst pain. Thank you. That was good. This morning I read to you um, our scripture for the morning is from First Peter, the fourth chapter. Uh, verses 8 through 11. Hear these words. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining, like good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do as one, speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies, so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Pray with me if you would, please. God, may you reveal to us in these words the life that you would have us to live through Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. In 1938, researchers at Harvard Medical School began the study of adult development. And I'm sure that researchers that began this study would be surprised to learn that the study is still going on 
some eight decades later. They thought they were going to be doing a study on how achievement, fame, and wealth would make a difference over a person's lifespan. The study included 268 men of the 1938 Harvard College sophomore class, and yes, they were men because Harvard College was not co-ed then. And the study came to include 456 boys from Boston's poorest neighborhoods chosen specifically because they were from some of the most troubled and disadvantaged families and living in very challenging conditions. The study included medical exams and tests as well as ongoing interviews about how life was going. The researchers studied the, particip the participants' health trajectories and their broader lives, including things that you would consider success in careers and marriages, and they were surprised at what they found. They did not find that health and happiness came from fame or wealth or even working harder and harder. Robert Waldinger, who is the current director of this study, says, the surprising finding is that our relationships and how happy we are in our relationships has a powerful influence on our health. Taking care of your body is important, but tending to your relationships is a form of self-care too. That, I think, he said, is the biggest revelation from the study. The study has identified three ways that healthy relationships are good for us physically and emotionally. Social connections are really good for us, number one, and the study points out that loneliness can literally kill us. People who are more socially connected to family, to friends, to community are happier, they're physically healthier, and they live longer than people who are less well-connected. The experience of loneliness turns out to be toxic. People who are more isolated than they want to be from others find that they are less happy, their health declines earlier in middle life, and their brain function declines sooner, and they live shorter lives than people who are not lonely. More than one in five people, sadly, will report that they are lonely. So the second thing that the study points out for us is that it's not about the number of friends you have. It's not whether or not you're in a committed relationship, but it is the quality of your close relationships that matters. It turns out that living in the midst of conflict is really bad for our health. High-conflict marriages, for example, that don't have a lot of affection, turn out to be very bad for our health, perhaps worse than getting divorced. But living in the midst of good, warm relationships is protective. When the researchers looked at the men in their 50s, by the time they had reached their 50s, and they tried to predict who would grow into their later years in a happy and healthy way, it turns out that it wasn't cholesterol levels that told that story. But it was how satisfied they were in their relationships. The people who were the most satisfied at age 50 were the healthiest at age 80. Some of those 80-year-olds even reported that on the days when they had more physical pain than others, their mood stayed just as happy. So the third thing that we learned from the study is that good relationships protect our brains. People in their 80s who have someone or someones in their life that they feel that they can really count on in times of need, those people's memories stay sharper longer. People who don't feel they could count on their relationships experienced earlier memory decline. So wow, clearly close relationships, more than money or fame or achievement, 
are what keep us happy and healthy throughout our lives. So healthy relationships are essential to our well-being. I value this study for putting science behind what many of us would readily agree with. It is the people in our lives that can make us the happiest. So I told Mark Cox, my husband, I told Mark Cox, it's good to know that Nanocamp may just keep us young and add a few years to our lives, no matter how worn out we feel on Monday evening. My four-year-old granddaughter a few weeks ago, on the day that we were making magic potions out of colored water and bits of glitter and, and what have you, as she was leaving that day, she, <laughs> she looked up at me, I bent over to kiss her, and she, she noticed, you know, the roots in my hair, they're not are not as brown as they are today, but she noticed them. And she said, you know what, Nana, you need to get a magic potion to put on your head so you won't get so old. As it turns out, my dear, you are my magic potion. So I value this study for putting science behind it. But I also value it for another reason. Because slipped in among all the statistics was a short and simple statement. Relationships are complex and complicated. Can I get an amen? Relationships are complex and complicated. I can say this. Because in my life, I have been, or still am, a granddaughter, a great niece, a daughter, a niece, a cousin, both the once removed and the second kind, a sister, a student, a classmate, a roommate, a best friend, a girlfriend, a fiancé, a wife, a daughter-in-law, a sister-in-law, an aunt, a great aunt, a co-worker, a supervisor, a supervisee, a neighbor, a mother, a candidate for ministry, a pastor, both the solo and the associate kind, a teacher, a mentor, a wife, again, a stepmother, a mother-in-law, and a grandmother. There's a lot of relationships to navigate. And if there is any common ground among them, it is that they all have their own ground rules. They all have their own intricacies, and they all, all, and you, and you have to respect that, that they all have their own ground rules and intricacies and, and dances that you do. You have to respect that. And they all also require energy and time and commitment to make them work. You know that, right? Because you, too, are in are navigating a lot of relationships. So you know that. So if the Harvard study does anything for you today, if sharing that with you this morning does anything for you today, I hope you'll hear it as permission. No, as an imperative to make time for the relationships in your life. To take time for the people in your life that matter, that support you, that lift you up and have your back when times are difficult. Because those are your healthy relationships. And if you're wondering whether or not your relationship is healthy, I invite you to, to think again about our welcome statement and, and, and compare that to your relationship. Does your relationship, relationship celebrate your work? your dignity, and your gifts as a child of God. If you can say yes, then that's a healthy relationship. So invest in those. Invest in those people because those are essential. Those are life-giving relationships. But the other thing I know from the long list of relationships that I have navigated is that Relationships aren't always 
healthy. Relationships aren't always perfect. Sometimes relationships wound you. They don't start out that way. You don't want them to be that way. But one day you wake up and that's where you are. The people that you used to think of as your crew or your team, the ones who used to lift you up, the ones you look to for support are now putting you down. Or worse, they won't have anything to do with you at all. Maybe you know what I mean. The writer of First Peter knows what I mean. And so do the people who first received this letter, because they knew firsthand what a broken relationship feels like. They lived near the end of the first century, and they were part of churches in Asia Minor who were Gentile converts. And what that means is that they didn't inherit this faith. They weren't Jewish first, believers in the one true God of Israel who who then came to believe that, that Jesus was God's way of saving God's people. No, they had been worshiping many gods, the, the gods of the empire, but they had heard this good news. This good news of what God had done in Jesus, and they found it so compelling, so convicting, that it changed their lives. And and they left behind their their old way of believing it, and they laid it all down for this hope, this hope that God was offering new beginnings through Christ. And when they did, Not everyone in their lives understood. In fact, very few did. And their very new beliefs, at the very least, put put a strain on their closest relationships. But probably more commonplace, it made them the object of ridicule and humiliation by people that they used to consider close. Do you know what that feels like? To find yourself in direct opposition with family or friends because of the values you hold to be fundamental to who you are. I suspect that many of you do. In the last year and a half, there has been much to fracture relationships. There have been many values that have been questioned. Masking. Vaccination, election, which lives matter, critical race theory, monuments to keep or destroy, Supreme Court decisions, reproductive rights, arguments that have taken over your dinner tables and and your break rooms and your Facebook pages until you find yourself so weary you just want to retreat or or you want to lash out. First Peter says, don't. Don't do that. Instead, be true to who you are. Be true to your identity as a child of God in Christ and act in love. Because love covers a multitude of sins. I think what the author means by that is is that because of what God accomplished through the resurrection, we have a promise that there's always hope, always hope that a relationship can be restored, that there can be reconciliation, but only through love, not retaliation, not vengeance, not frustration or withdrawal. Only love can repair brokenness. Only love can find a way to reconciliation. Because love leaves a door open instead of closing it forever. Now that doesn't mean that you have to let yourself be abused or disrespected. I strongly believe that love has boundaries that we can't neglect or compromise on. First Peter is, is clear about maintaining our identity in Christ and And identity has boundaries, so we can't fall back from what we believe. And and we can't let folks, no matter how much they mean to us or meant to us, 
try to blur those boundaries and walk on what really matters to us. That's being authentic to our identity. And, and creating boundaries creates mutual respect. Boundaries help us be compassionate and empathetic without compromising our beliefs. Brene Brown is the research professor at the University of Houston, where she holds the Huffington Foundation Endowed Chair. And she spent the last two decades studying courage, vulnerability, shame, and empathy. She is very wise. And any chance you get to hear a podcast or read a, a passage or a book from her, I encourage you to take the time to do that. She studied compassionate, empathetic people because she believed that those were the people who experienced the healthiest of relationships. These were people who would be living what First Peter describes as the love that covers a multitude of sins. Her study even included monks. And she looked for the variables that they might all share in common. She found that to a person, they had boundaries. They were very boundaried people. She says that we can have much more loving and compassionate relationships if we have boundaries. She says it's much more likely that we will have genuine love and care for others if they are not violating our boundaries. Boundaries are the foundation of empathy, which I believe is the kind of love that First Peter's talking about. In this circumstance, it, it, it might look something like saying to, to someone, I care about you. I love to be around you. I, I love to celebrate the holidays with you and sit at the dinner table with you. But it's not okay if you're humiliating my point of view or if you make me feel uncomfortable because of what I believe. It's pretty brave. It's taking a risk, but boundaries give us room to be empathetic. They help us maintain our integrity. And when we maintain our integrity, then we are in a space where we can be empathetic and generous with each other. Because remember, relationships can only be healthy when they're mutual and fulfilling for both people. And they create this space where, where both people can be authentic and vulnerable and can feel celebrated for their worth, their dignity, and their gifts. You don't think you can do that? You don't think you can have a conversation? There's someone in your life that you're thinking about right now. You see their face in your head and you're thinking, I can't say that. I can't do that. Here's my invitation to you something you might expect a pastor to say. Pray about it. And I say that because, because I had an experience one time. There was, there was a family member, and it was Christmas, and, and I was dreading get, the get-together that was going to happen later that day because that person always, always seemed to just walk right over me and act as if what I felt was important didn't matter at all. And before we got there, before we got to their house, I prayed. And I prayed this simple prayer, God, show me a door, any kind of door. Show me a door and give me a way in to have a healthy conversation. I don't remember exactly what that door was, but I do remember that in that in that gathering, in that time, and that person had started once again, and I just kept praying, God, please show me a door. Show me a door that will open it and give us both a space in which we can be in this space and, and hold each other with integrity. And as I was praying, I realized in the conversation we were having, we were already in that space because the conversation took a very different turn than it usually did and I was interested in what this person had to say. And I felt that this person was listening, really listening to me. Give me a way in. God, show me a door. 
because love is about reconciliation, respect, and empathy. So know this, that relationships are a gift from God, and God will help you care for them and help you find ways to keep them healthy. God knows relationships matter. People in your life matter. God wants you to, to love them as if your life depends on it. Because it just might. In this space, in our worship service, we've, we've got a time now that we can respond to what God's word might be doing in our lives and in our hearts. We've brought back our candle table, which is a, a tradition that we had before COVID. And and we're doing it in a more measured way. We invite you to come either to this table here at the front. There's also a station at the back. And and you'll have a, a candle. Of the hand, I'll hand somebody a candle. And, and then you'll just pass it to the person behind you. Try to stay distanced if you can. There are, there are tape marks on the carpet to help you judge the distance. Um, but light a candle. And then turn and give it the taper to the person behind you. Light a candle for someone who's on your mind or heart, someone that, that you want to repair a relationship. Maybe you want to give thanks and praise to God for the healthy relationships in your life that are keeping you healthy. It's your chance to, to celebrate them and those relationships. This is also a time for us to practice generosity because generosity helps us to grow in our faith as well. You can see on the screen that you can text to give. There's also a, a basket here by this candle station and, and the one at the back. If you have a, a physical offering that you want to bring, you can put it in that basket. You can always still give online and send in a check to our street address if you wish. Know that when you practice generosity, it, 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 you experience, uh, it, it, it grows your own faith. But I also want you to know that when you practice generosity here at this church, you are investing in relationships because here at, at St. Paul's we value growing healthy relationships through our, our kids program, Kids Connection, Kids 456, through our youth group, through our small group program for adults. We develop relationships where we can hold each other accountable in love and joy and grace and we hold each other in, in, uh, in that care of a healthy relationship. So I invite you now. To, to come and, and to uh, be ready to respond to God in this moment.
Bless the gifts our hands have brought, and bless the work our hearts have planned. Ours is the faith, the will, the thought, the rest, O oh God, is in your hands. Please be seated. Find after a deep breath. Let's pray together. God of mercy and grace, this morning we open our hearts to you, knowing that we bring so much. We know that the very earth groans this morning as wildfires are raging and Hurricanes are destroying, and our climate continues to warm and change. God, it makes us weary. We are weary of disaster. We're tense from concern and from fear. If you'll help us as we watch each evening's news, so hear us, God, as we share ourselves and our prayers and our hopes with you. Work us, God, with a reverent sense of your presence. We lift up these petitions to you. We pray for students, students who have newly returned to school. We pray for their curiosity and imagination and intellect to bloom. We pray that they persevere through every new challenge, that they take advantage of their education, that they work hard to develop their emerging skills. We pray also for parents and teachers still navigating the change and pressures brought on by the pandemic. Bless these, we pray, with your wisdom and grace. We pray for our nation and our nation's leaders. In this time of national turmoil, come near, God, to, to both judge and to save. When we turn from your way, help us repent and return. May our leaders be led by your wisdom. And may they clearly discern your will and seek to follow it. We pray also for those who serve our nation through the military. Keep these sons and daughters safe. Keep them from being hardened by war. Restore them from moral injury. Heal them from physical and mental and spiritual pain. We pray for the suffering all across our globe. We pray Pray for peace, peace to reign in Afghanistan, for the Afghani people to enjoy the freedom and dignity that they deserve. We pray for mercy for the people of Haiti, for respite from their endless woes, for prosperity for a country desperate. We pray for all those who must endure violence, destruction, and abuse. We pray for for all those who have been harmed this week. May they know that your love is unconditional. Save us, God, from sectarian thinking that leads us to believe that others' problems are not our own. Remind us of our interconnectedness and the suffering, that the suffering of some is a suffering for us all. Mighty and merciful God, we praise you for sending healing and hope through doctors and nurses and researchers who bless us with new science and technology to serve and to save. We glorify you for your constant presence, for your help, and for your hope. May your world and all who live in it be renewed through the power of the risen Christ and, and those committed to being Christ's hands and feet in a hurting world. Unite us as a family of faith and remind us that we are the body of Christ as we lift up our prayers to you. For you are our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Hear us as we pray the prayer that Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Let us stand as we're able to sing our closing hymn. couple of reminders as we leave this morning we're going to leave through that door over there and uh, you're welcome to mingle and and visit with folks out in the parking lot and and if you're vaccinated fully vaccinated masks are optional outside also a reminder that today is first Sunday food drive so we welcome any kind of contributions you can bring for that and then I don't know what you have planned for the rest of the day but this weekend you know, you get an extra day, I hope, tomorrow. Um, think of it as a gift of time, time that you can use to invest in those relationships that matter. Maybe the grass doesn't need cutting right away. Maybe that garage can wait another weekend before you reorganize it. Maybe your life depends today on investing in those relationships that keep you healthy. And let us go from here knowing that we go with the love of a creator God, the passion of a risen Savior, and the power of the Holy Spirit that leads us this day and every day.